Hey friends, welcome once again to another episode of Strange Planet. And if you'd like to get deeper into Strange Planet, you might want to consider becoming a premium subscriber, and it's real easy to do. Just click on the link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. There are three monthly subscriber tiers to choose from. You gain access to commercial-free listening, special bonus episodes produced exclusively for premium subscribers, and you receive a monthly subscription to my newsletter, Inner Sanctum, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. In uh, January of this year, 2024, new legislation was proposed by uh, bipartisan lawmakers in the United States to protect civilian pilots and air personnel who report sightings of unidentified aerial phenomena, more commonly known as UFOs. Under the Safe Airspace for Americans Act, led by Representatives Robert Garcia and Glenn Grothman, pilots were encouraged or are encouraged to provide information to the U.S. government, primarily the Federal Aviation Administration, which would relay reports to the Pentagon's All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or ARO, in exchange for legal safeguards. Meanwhile, in the U.K., a team of UAP and aviation researchers have created a platform for pilots and other air crew to come forward and report their encounters with UAP, secure in the knowledge that their identities and careers can be protected. The stated mission of UK pilots reporting UAP is to analyze and share credible data to increase public awareness and understanding of these aerial occurrences. The website just launched UK pilots reporting UAP.co.uk. Gary Hesseltine is with us. He's uh, the creator of this uh, website and the research team. Is He's a, a former RAF pol uh, police and British transport police officer. He was a detective for 19 years and a former advanced interviewer of suspects and witnesses. In 2002, he launched an unofficial national police database for British police officers to report and collate their UFO, UFO UAP reports. In April 2013, following his retirement from the police, he launched UFO Truth Magazine, which is a bi-monthly e-zine. In 2021, he was one of the co-founders of ICER, the International um, Coalition for Extraterrestrial Research. He currently holds the position of vice president. ICER is an international NGO compromise, uh, comprising rather scientists, academics, and leading UFO UAP researchers with national representatives in the 30 countries. In February of 2023, he published his first book, Non-Human, The Rendlesham Forest UFO Incidents, 42 Years of Denial, following a five-year reinvestigation of Britain's most famous UFO case, The Rendlesham Forest Incident. In December of 2023, he founded UK Pilots Reporting UAP, which went live on December the 2nd, 2024. Gary Hesseltine, welcome back to Strange Planet. How are you? Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back on. Thank you for inviting me. So I mentioned uh, the, the um, uh, Safe Airspace for Americans Act, uh, which would provide some legal safeguards to civilian pilots and air crew in exchange for their reporting. Uh, one, uh, I would then have to conclude, uh, you have no such legislation in the UK, hence this website. Yes, uh, the website has been born out of a degree of frustration that I've had for several years, uh, in the sense that in America, there's been huge leaps since 2017. But in the UK, it's like we've stood still. You know, um, when when there was the New York Times article, uh, I thought, oh, this might be interesting because we always follow America's lead. But we didn't. And very strangely, it's one of the few times in history that we haven't followed America's lead. And I wonder why. Uh, I still absolutely convinced that there are pilot cases, civilian and military, that are being seen. Whether they're reported is another matter, but they are encountering these objects. Why would they not be? Because they pretty much happen in every country of the world. So I'm intrigued by why the UK is differing from America's lead. And it strikes me that it, 
we need to do something about it in the UK. Do you care to speak? We're a long we're a long way behind America mm. and with Ryan Graves, Americans for Safe Aerospace. But you've got to start somewhere. And with the expertise I've gathered over many years since the, the Proof Force Police Database, I thought, you know, we should be doing something. We should be trying to tackle the aviation industry and trying to recreate something similar to Americans for safe aerospace. So when you create something like this, obviously there is a need. Before you launched um, UK Pilots Reporting UAP.co.uk, were pilots reaching out to you sort of off the record and saying, please create something like this? Uh, the honest answer is no. Uh, and that's because I think we're a long way behind where America has become. We're very backward in this area. Uh, what I did do is spent several months um, looking at historical British cases, proving that there had been incursions of UAP, uh, a lot of them which being corroborated by pilots, multiple pilots. So a few of those cases I've put on the website already in like a pre format. And that's done just to prove that cases historically have been happening since the 1940s involving British pilots. So I've no doubt that cases will come, but you need uh, media coverage. We want mainstream media newspapers and TV. Now, as yet, we're not getting that coverage, despite its uh, public launch last week, although I'm talking to several newspapers and several of the team are talking to newspapers. So I'm certain it will come, but that's what you need, because I doubt that many pilots, say if you're a commercial pilot still working now, are probably going to be following UFO Twitter or, you know, all these kind of podcasts. Right. So what you need is the oxygen of mainstream media to get the word out that something's happening, that something's been created, and then they can know where to go. All right, so tell us about the team that you've assembled. I've got an excellent team. Um, I'd start with Dave Hodrian. Uh, he's my uh, deputy for the ISA. Uh, so I'm the national representative for the UK. He's the deputy national representative. He's uh, been a researcher since about 2008. He runs the Birmingham UFO Group, a very popular group in the UK. He's a writer, he's a regular columnist for UFO Truth magazine. I've known him for a long time, trust him implicitly, and he's our top uh, abduction contact researcher. Um, so then I would look at Alan Foster who was of a similar age to me, I think probably early 60s, and he has been uh, studying this subject since a, a, a childhood sighting when I think he was about 15 or 16, very similar timeline to my own. Uh, he's been an international lecturer and writer for 15 or 16 years. I met him probably 15 years ago. And interestingly, he used to work in the aviation industry in the distribution side so he worked on airports so he has an advanced knowledge of how airports work and the aviation system civilian system works so he's useful and then finally and i only wanted a very small team because if you create something that's too big it's unwieldy and it becomes bureaucratic a small number you can have a little WhatsApp group. You can be in real-time contact. That's what I want. Fast action, quick communication. And the last member of the team is a guy called Chris Gaffney. Now, he's based in Ireland. He's Irish. Um, and he is also the deputy national representative in ISA for Ireland. Now, I don't make a distinction politically between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland not in the category like this. It's, for me, it's still British and Irish airspace, so it includes Irish airspace, of which there's been a lot of sightings uh, in near the Republic of Ireland, Dublin, Shannon Airport, around there. What's good about him, he is a private pilot, so he holds a current licence. He's got hundreds of hours of flight experience, and he is like our FOI John Greenwald kind of mould. He is an FOI specialist, and he has been doing sterling work 
in trying to chase up on EU regulations and uncover. And it, he likes nothing better than somebody to say, we don't have any information. And then it, uh, somebody will make a little slip and he'll put in an appeal and he'll get a little bit more and he'll keep digging. And you need those kind of people. So I think I've got an excellent team that can deal with what comes our way and can start to uh, begin a process where we, one, approach the government, the UK government, uh, probably will get stonewalled, because they've always stonewalled on this subject. The Ministry of Defence will stonewall us, but you've got to start somewhere. So from my point of view, is that if we can get a lot of media coverage, we get pilots coming forward, especially if they're serving, if they're still commercial pilots, still active, then that would then give me and the rest of the team credence to go back to the government and say, look, privately, we've had 20 pilots contact us in recent months, say they are encountering these things, but they don't report them probably because of ridicule, fear of ridicule, and more importantly, a, a risk that they'll be grounded, which is historically what's happened to pilots. So they're, they're very real things, and they are the same things that affect effectively all professional people. They don't want to be ridiculed. They don't want to risk their career in pension and be labelled a UFO nutter. Now, that stigma is receding, which is thankful, Finally, after 60, 70 years, it's about time. So now I think it's a good time to start an investigation, to start asking questions. And we have little kind of nibbles, because if you remember maybe Larry Maguire, the Canadian mm -hmm. MP, I think it was February 2023, he said that there'd been a briefing for the Five Eyes group about crash retrievals. And yes you know, going on down the David Grush kind of thing and the, and the congressional hearing last year. So the British government are just totally clammed up on this. But I've no doubt that there is pilots, commercial and military, who are still seeing things. So it's, it's really, it's a question of let's get the information out there to say there is somewhere that you can report it to. Um, there's been a really nice couple of people who are well-known people like Christopher Sharp at Liberation Times, they've immediately backed the, you know, the, the creation of the the website. And also Ross Coulter did a lovely piece on Twitter, UFO, UAP Media News. They did a full page on it. And yourself, you've picked up on it. And this is what we need to get the message out there to pilots, that there is somewhere. And now we will protect your identity like I've done with police officers. I've had been in contact with police officers for 20 years. And the general rule is if you're still serving, you don't want to have your identity revealed. And the, the, I, I'll say, fine, as long as you your credentials check out to me, you can be a confidential source. And what I mean by a confidential source is it's 100% checked out by me. They are valid pilots in this case. But then we will change the story slightly so their flight can't be identified. We won't give their flight number, who they work for. But we can say, for example, that a pilot was flying a commercial uh, 747 between London and New York with 300 passengers when this happened, so and so. And that's what we're trying to do is get that story out there without endangering the career of the pilot concerned or the air crew. All right. So um, this is um, intended for not only pilots, but air crew. That would be flight attendants. Yeah. It could even be a baggage handler. Absolutely. Well, if you if you think of O'Hare oh, Airport, 2006, mm -hmm. that's really where it started. Yes, exactly. The baggage handlers are looking on. There's this thing hovering above one of the terminals that then punches through the cloud. And at first it was treated like a joke. But uh, enough audio recordings have come forward to confirm that that incident really happened. Uh, making it UAP anyway. What it was, we don't know, but it's definitely UAP related. Now, the, the, the categories that are on the website are UK pilots reporting UAP in British airspace, British and or Irish airspace. It can also be international pilots 
who are traveling in and out of UK airspace, mm-hmm. when they encounter something, then it can also be aviation professionals, radar operators, air traffic controllers, like you say, baggage handlers, etc. If they've got a story that's relevant to a bigger story, where multiple probably different type of jobs are involved, if you think of an airport, they'd probably be the air traffic controllers, people with binos looking from the tower, baggage handlers, whoever, people driving machinery around the airfield. You know, so those kind of incidents we want to know about because what it's saying is there is UAP activity taking place in the UK. And this is totally contrary to what the UK have been putting out for many years. Um, there, there was a, I think there was a House of Lords, which is our upper house of, you've got House of Commons, and then the upper house, which is generally elderly people with peerages, uh, and they, they had a debate for about 12 minutes. I think it was 2021 when the first uh, American report came out. Uh, uh, under the uh, NDAA legislation. And there was quite a lot of media coverage. And they did this 12 minutes. Well, it was like a time capsule because it was like you'd gone back to the 1950s. The, albeit many of the elderly people in the House of Lords, and not all were elderly, but the vast majority were elderly, they were totally oblivious to all the developments that had taken place since 2017. So when you read the transcript, it's like a, a time warp. You you could have a transcript in the 1950s where they debated this, and there really wouldn't be any difference. And that shows you how far we're behind, officially. But look at this. There is no coordinated acceptance of the UAP label with regards to reporting any cited in the UK whether it by the military, as far as we're aware, or commercial pilots. There is no discussion where UAP is mentioned. The best you'll get, as far as I can see, is what's called the Air Air Proximity Board that looks at near collisions. And they publish uh, generally monthly a report of incidents in the UK. And a lot now are drones mm. now some of these will undoubtedly be drones but some of them are at twenty thousand feet and that's generally not drones unless it's military and the the, the air traffic controllers would know about it if there was in the uk airspace especially in a flight line so you've got all these conundrums and you do actually have a small proportion on the air props reports that are deemed unknown object now really we should be classifying these as genuine unknowns, i.e. UAP. We're not saying what they are, but what they're saying is that it's something that cannot be explained in terrestrial or meteorological explanations. So those kind of cases are what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in the ones that can be explained, but I'm interested in the unidentified anomalous phenomena. Uh, Gary, just give um, listeners kind of a, a quick tour whirlwind tour of the website and and if they're a, a pilot or a member of an air crew uh how they would use this website well the idea is obviously there's a contact page at the bottom of the uh, website uh, we now live in a very media streaming world most people now will probably access through their smartphone and mobile phones tablets rarely is it computers now uh, the quick medium is you're out and about, you're looking on your smartphone, so it's it's laid out for desktop, uh, for, for the phone. And at the, the end of the uh, website, there is a contact form. And it will basically say, make initial contact, and it, I'm the press officer, and I have an email that created for the website called UK Pilots Report in UAP, and all it is is my name in front of it. So Gary Eseltine at UK Pilots Report in UAP. Yeah, .co.uk. So that's my email. That They then can either fill in the contact form or email at this that I've just given out. That will then, uh, say, for example, it turns out that it's an Irish pilot that contacts us. Well, I've got Chris Gaffney in Ireland. 
So I will then push that contact to Chris Gaffney. Um, Alan Foster lives in Wales, so part of Great Britain. So if I get a Welsh case, I'm going to pass that to Alan Foster. Uh, myself uh, and uh, Dave Hodrian will cover the rest of the UK and Scotland. So if you see what I mean, and plus if it's a big case, a multiple incident like OA Airport, then we'd all muck in. But the point is, we're all there. We're all experienced UAP researchers, UFO. I still like the word UFO. It's a far sexier term, but I understand the political connotations. And the bottom line is, we want to look at it from the air safety aspect, which is how Ryan Graves has ended up with this legislation and how the reintroduction of the subject from 2017 was framed basically under air safety there are can we prove that there are objects and the americans concluded very quickly there are objects uh with unknown characteristics flight maneuverability etc that are, that appear to fly with impunity in u.s airspace so that's how it's been framed and why shouldn't we do the same and literally every country could do the same I think there's a, uh, there was a new website, I think three or four months ago, a coalition in the Netherlands, Holland, as we would say in the UK, but the Netherlands. It's a coalition, again, for, for pilots and UAP to report things. I think every country should now be looking at America and thinking, well, if there's legislation that can be put forward to the FAA the, the, in America, in the UK with the CAA, Civil Aviation, but and the military as well, there should be a coordinated set of reporting procedures across every country. Why should we have a system of 100 and 200 and odd countries doing 200 and odd different systems? It doesn't make sense. We should formalize a standard report form. So I'll be looking at what emerges through the American legislation and saying, well, why can't we mirror that? to the UK airspace eventually. We've got to get down the line of opening up a, um, an avenue to the government, to the Ministry of Defence, which at the moment they're not, they're not playing with. And that's why we need the, the oxygen of the pilot reports coming forward, because that's new news. And that's what attracts the newspapers. And that's what will raise the profile in the mainstream media. We can do all we can within the UFO community, but even though it's popular, it's still deemed as a minority. And we need this oxygen of mainstream coverage to get the story out there that there is a new body in the UK. So that's what we're really trying to do is bring awareness to an issue that's literally being covered up. And yet historically, there's 15, 20 cases already on the database that are going right back to the 1940s, Second World War involving British pilots. So, and there are many others that I'm researching at the moment. So there will be more and more going on there, but we want new information coming in because that will aid me to say, look, we have got things going on in our airspace. We need to start dealing with it. Gary, we'll take a quick time out back to more of my conversation with Gary Heseltine, UK pilots reporting UAP right here on Strange Planet. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.
Gary Hesseltine is with us, and the new um, website is UKPilotsReporting, UAP.co.uk. And uh, Gary Hesseltine, uh, one of the co founders of ICER, the International Coalition for Extraterrestrial Research. And um, this new website just launched in. Um, w- when did the last site go week. live? Just last, last week it went live. Yeah, yeah, the 12th. The 12th of February. All right. Um, you were asking off the top, you know, wondering aloud, why is he, is the UK sort of lagging behind when the United States has passed, or they're seeking to pass this uh, Safe Aerospace for Americans Act, encouraging pilots to come forward, uh, providing the le- legal um, safeguards so that their careers won't be jeopardized by reporting on these incidents. You care to speculate as to why the UK is is lagging behind? I find it very odd, to be honest, because like I said earlier, Historically, we have followed America on virtually everything that's ever happened since the end of the Second World War. So it seems a bit bizarre now that, at least publicly, there is no interest. I mean, let 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 me highlight an example where, in two thousand and nine, the Ministry of Defence closed its UFO desk. Now, that was the desk where Nick Pope worked mm-hmm. on for two or three years, albeit that Nick Pope never ran it. He just worked there as a, a 24 years old. So never ran anything. Uh, but he would run that desk between 91 and 94. But in 2009, suddenly the MOD closed its UFO desk that had been operating for over 50 years and that was open for anybody, pilots, member of the public, police officers, and there were thousands of cases going back all those 50 years. And then they closed it saying, there's never been one confirmed case in the UK of an object, an unknown object, entering the UK airspace. Now, that's demonstrably false. And if we go back to Rendlesham Forest and my book, Non-Human, I established that over four or five days, there were 17 different timed UFO events. And that's just one major incident. It, and all these cases that are on the uh, new website already highlight that things were being seen in UK airspace, often tracked on radar, often multiple corroboration by air crew. Uh, and, and it's ridiculous. But that sums up the MOD because they said there's nothing ever being found in 50 years. What's the point in doing it? It's a waste of money. We'll save 55,000 pounds. That's what they actually said in 2009. And it was a demonstrable false lie to the British public. But if you think of uh, the UK MOD desk that ran for 50 years, it was basically a lip service, a bit like Project Blue Book was a lip service pretending to be a real investigation, but it wasn't. I'm sure other agencies within the um, MOD did real investigations, but not publicly. And the front desk was the UFO, the, the, the UAP desk, the UFO desk that ran for 50 years, and it basically was just a correspondence. People would write in and say, I've seen this. There was a standardized form that had been developed from America. It was pretty much a one-page report, maybe 15 or 16 questions, but invariably they were filled in very poorly. And we know that because of the freedom of information that came in around 2009 to 2013. They disclosed a lot of these thousands and thousands of records, and they were basically hardly filled in there were no real details on them. There was nothing that you could follow up on. The only difference there would be would be the occasional police officer report. So that got a bit more coverage, a bit more interest from the MOD, and then pilots. And again, there are many records pertaining to pilot reports, um, helicopter reports, those kind of reports that are on in the UK. But there's nothing, according to the Ministry of Defence, or the UK government that's ever been unknown in our airspace. It's an absolute joke. 
And as yet, they've never really been scrutinized. And I think now is the time, because of the developments in the States, to say, right, okay, we're really going to try to dig into this. And it may take a while, and it may take a while to get the knowledge of the, the new website out there. But we will get there, and I am absolutely convinced that we will get pilots and air crew coming forward with interesting cases. And that will just give us the ammunition to say, look, there are things happening. This happened two weeks ago to a commercial pilot happening between uh, over at uh, UK airspace. We need to be doing something about this from an air safety perspective. Clearly, we have to try to identify objects that are in UK airspace purely from a commercial air safety point of view. If there's something that's unknown, we ought to know about it. And yes, some of them will no doubt be drones, etc. but there will be UAP. Let's imagine uh, a pilot, uh, let's say Air, Air Lingus, is flying into Shannon, and yeah. they have to do some sort of an invasive maneuver because of some a UAP, object an object coming yeah. close. Yeah. How how does it work now? Let's imagine this this is before you've launched UK pilots reporting UAPs. How, how, would, how would it work? What does that pilot do? Well, basically, a report may be made, but it's not going to be labeled UAP. There will be different systems, and uh, they're not encouraged to report. If there is a report, it's generally kept in-house. It would generally end up as an air, props, air proximity report, i.e. a near miss, and there'd be a board assembled to investigate the details and then it would be uh, given out usually a few months later in, a, in a, like an updated package once a month. But these reports are not designed to cater for UAP. They'll cater for drones, but they're not catered for other, which is really what we're talking about. You know, if you go back to America, everybody was thinking for a long time, the media were wanting it to be foreign adversary, or terrestrial technology, secret US tape. Whereas now, and for people that's been following it for a long time, we know that it points in the proportion to unknown, whatever that unknown is. I People talk about now non-human, hence the story of my book, the title of my book. We're dealing with non-human intelligence, whatever that is, whether it be extraterrestrial, interdimensional, ultra-dimensional, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. It's not human, and it's intelligent, and it's interacting with planet Earth. And I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that what's happening in the States and other countries is happening in UK space. And we have to start to have a real worldwide serious discussion. We've had congressional hearings in Mexico, Brazil. I spoke in, to the Brazilian Senate. We've now had a succession of... Uh, of different types of congressional hearings in the States, apparently more field hearings are planned. I don't think Congress is now going to let this go. And the, you know, David Grush coming out, uh, Larry Maguire in Canada pushing the issue, uh, I think it, it's the tip of an iceberg. We know that other first-hand legacy witnesses, according to Grush, what, 40 people he interviewed over four years, they gave, or many of those gave testimony to the Inspector General, uh, and therefore their testimony is ready to come out at some point, albeit in some kind of doxa related release form like Grush's. But once they start coming forward, we're very close to a disclosure that you and I have been trying to uh, establish for many, many years. I can't think of a time in my lifetime, and I'm 63 now, I had a sighting when I was 16 years old, so I've had an interest for 47 years. I can't think of any time in my life when we are um, closer to having a major breakthrough. I mean, you think about the Schumer Amendment. It got shredded by a few powerful senators, but that legislation could come back as a set standalone bill. People talk about that. Had that have come in, uh, without being called, 
I think you'd have been in a, it would have given the the, the president a platform for later this year to or next year to come out and say we're dealing with a non-human. It got it got gutted, um, and I didn't think it would to be honest, because I thought there'd be enough people like Senator Rubio, Gallagher, etc., Gillibrand to do to to like step in and fight the corner. I'm not quite sure how American uh, committees work, but they seem to have some senators with really superpowers that can override many others, which is a bit bizarre. It's not a one one country, one vote. It's not democracy in that sense. I don't quite understand the American policy. But the point is, had the Schumer Amendment um, got through without being pulled, we'd have already been in the UAP Disclosure Act of 2023. Now, think about the reverberations that would have caused around the world. I mean, to think just five years ago that there could ever be a, an act dealing with UAP, a non-human, uh, or a craft of unknown origin, etc. cetera, it, it, it's, it's almost science fiction to people who've been in the subject a long time. So we must be very close. And you've got, you've, in, just in recent months, you've got people like uh, Admiral, Rear Admiral Tim Galladay, what a guy he is. He's come out of woodwork and said, yeah, we are dealing with non-human. We need to have a serious discussion. And that's what we should be doing because this is not a singular American issue. It's not a singular Canadian issue. It's not a singular UK issue. It's a global phenomenon happening probably in every country of the world. And we need to start dealing it as a global entity, a serious discussion. Let's begin to have a dialogue and hence why I became a part of ISA because that was a forum to say look there needs to be a worldwide discussion because in the end we are only one human race and if there is some extraterrestrial species or there is some hitherto unknown pre-human civilization that's in our deep underground uh, trenches, ocean trenches that some people speculate if it is interdimensional, the point is we're dealing with something that's engaging us. We might not really know anything, but I think the public deserve to be told. We live in an age of multimedia. We're not frightened sheep like we used to be. We're not running awesome wells to the hills in the droves because we hear a radio broadcast. We're, we're kind of close. You think about the Soul Foundation. Stanford University, prestigious people, Gary Nolan, a, a Nobel-nominated scientist, saying 100% we're dealing with something non-human. The world has moved on so much, and yet the mainstream media still want it to believe that we're dealing with foreign adversary or even still secret US tech. If we're not. The performance characteristics are so in advance, we need to start getting our act together. We have to have this global discussion in the same way that the United Nations was designed to bring all countries to the world. We should be doing that and talking about this issue globally, because what are we going to do? It's not just America. It's not just Canada. It's not just the UK. It's every country of the world. And we now need to start to have a global discussion. And the air safety angle is what opens this up. And every country in the world can begin to start to look at the UAP air safety angle and create organizations to start to rectify that. We all need to talk to each other. I've already reached out to Ryan Graves and he's, you know, he's reached back. So there is communication going on there. So if I can do it, if Ryan Graves can do it, if the Netherlands can do it, every country can do it. Canada can do it. You know, we know that there's great cases in Canada. Again, uh, Australia, backward country in terms of UFOs. It's, uh, and the UK is becoming that. And I don't want it to be because there's a serious discussion to be had. Is the 
the resistance to this also coming from the airline industry. I, I don't know. Are there insurance issues? Are there liability issues? Why have they created this culture where air, where pilots fear for their and an air crew fear for their careers if they speak out and say, "I don't know what that thing was, but we it was a near miss." Well, I think that really is a legacy of uh, the Robertson panel from 1953. They created the era of stigma. Uh, by debunking everything that came in legislation came in for commercial pilots military pilots if they saw things they could be subject to imprisonment high fines ten thousand dollar fine now that was the time when uk very closely followed america's lead this is why it's unusual now because we've always followed uh, and then we did so that policy of stigma was adopted by the likes of australia canada uh, the UK, and we all caught, followed America's lead. And that stigma that lasted a good 65 years, 60 years, has been horrific. But it was very successful from, from their point of view. It worked incredibly well. And unfortunately, we lived then in an area where we were totally dominated by mainstream media. There was no alternative media. The internet has created alternative media. And you can see that that's growing and expanding in its impact. Regardless of what you think about politics of Tucker Carlson interviewing uh, President Putin, take that aside. I think the last time I looked, that had had 48 million views on social media. Now that shows you the power. Lots of uh, TV channels would love to have 48 million watching one of their shows and new shows, especially in the likes in the smaller countries. So. That shows you the power of alternative media, and which shows you that, in a sense, the mainstream, as it was, are now vulnerable to... Uh, let, let me give you an example. Um, Carl Nell talked about catastrophic disclosure, and that's an unexpected event. Well, I've been saying this for several years, that if we had another Phoenix Lights that happened in 1997, well, if you remember, maybe 50, 100,000 people over a 200-mile corridor captured, saw, tried to record on early video recorders what they'd seen. But unfortunately, the video technology of the day wasn't that capable. So the Americans kind of got away with it with, oh, it's military flares. They could create enough diversion. But if that happened incident tomorrow, what's people going to do with their 8K smartphones? They're, they're going to they're be live streaming. So if, if I was witnessing something outside my house now, I'd be live streaming on, on social media. Now, everybody's then going to tap into that. Hey, what's this? Whoa, what is that? And it would go on wildfire because now we can go viral. And if something's really good, it can go viral within an hour all around the world. Now, can you imagine? Every man and his dog is going to look at the Phoenix lights with 8K smart cameras, and we are going to get some good coverage. And the media, the mainstream media, are not going to be able to control it. The military are not going to be able to control it. The governments are not going to be controlled. That, that could happen tomorrow. That would be catastrophic disclosure because that's the evidence in abundance and people are going to be shocked. Why, what is this? And when they begin to realize how much they've not been told, there will be an outcry for a time. And I've again been saying this for over 10 years, that there should be truth and reconciliation when the dam breaks, when we do get a disclosure world. And what we want is not send people particularly to prison unless they're hurt people, etc. But if you've been involved in the cover-up, you need to go on the stand, give your evidence and say, I did this. Just so we can get our history records right. So we can write the history of the last, of the 20th century, the last 75 years of the, uh, uh, last 50 years of the uh, 20, 20th century and the early part of the 21st century. Let's get our history right. Let's get these people on the stand to give their evidence. And I'm sure that will come down the line. There's a few people have since mentioned 
truth and reconciliation, the South African model with apartheid. That's what they did. Uh, and so I think once we have a disclosure world, that will happen. You know, you've got Danny Sheehan uh, and, and his new institute uh, looking at that and the Schumer Amendment, had it gone through, would have created this kind of nine-person panel to, to disseminate and release information timely. In an ideal world, we shouldn't want a catastrophic disclosure. But unfortunately, I now am in the camp that says we need first-hand legacy witnesses to now come forward, albeit going through DOPSA to get a released version like Rush was able to do, a limited discussion of what they could say, but they need to come forward. And the New York Times said recently, okay, there's somewhat going on, but you need to put up or shut up. And I kind of agree. We need first-hand witnesses to come forward. And I think that's going to happen this year. Uh, but what I would suggest is if they are going to come forward, they come forward en masse, within days of each other, because there is power in safety in numbers. What, about, what are you going to do, send them all to prison? What about passengers? No, what about passengers? Do you welcome reports from passengers? And if, if not, why not? It's something that we'd look at, obviously, but it would have to be linked in to uh, a wider, um, did the air crew see it? Did the pilot see it? Did the co-pilot see it? If there's corroboration, then it would be good uh, corroborative evidence to say that the pilot, the co-pilot, uh, the, the air crew, the, stu you know, the, the staff on board and passengers observed a, a UAP incident. That's corroboration. So you're going to have it in that sense. But I would say in isolation, probably no, because that becomes too wide. Because if you just get a single person, unless they've recorded something that's bona fide video that shows something very clearly, you're going to have just an individual saying, I saw this. Well, we know that there's so many CGI uh, airline videos on the net, they're not worth anything. But if a pilot is backed up by 20, 20 passengers, then that's great corroborative testimony. So then it becomes relevant because it adds to the case. If you think of the O'Hare incident, we maybe have 15, 20 people, including pilots, including air traffic, including baggage handlers, etc. That's all a part of a single case, and you would get those statements. But in isolation, probably not, because there's no corroboration. Um, what about whistleblowers, uh, let's say a pilot who is now retired, but he's getting a pension, Yeah, wants to come forward. So I was flying British Airways yep. out of Heathrow. This is what happened. Uh, if he comes forward and says, I, I'm willing to give my name, yep. the, the flight number, yep. can they go after that pilot's pension? I think it, I think it would be extremely unlikely uh, I, I base that on the fact that of dealing with police officers for 20 years, it's exactly the same thing. You know, many of the, the majority of people that come forward police-wise are retired. They've got their pension, and not one has ever lost his pension who's gone public and said, I was on duty with PC, so-and-so, uh, and I saw this. So I don't think that would happen with pilots. They've had their career. They've got the pensions. They... Many of them actually come forward to me um, because they want to get it off their chest. Some of them I've spoke to never told their wives because they were told not to say anything. And yet if you'd seen something so bizarre that's probably changed your world view, you've no way to take this. So it can create almost a cancer that's eating away inside of you because it's a psychological trauma and you've no release. So often when I had police officers contact me, they were in tears. And they would often say, I'm embarrassed to tell you. And I'd say, look, believe me, nothing will surprise me. And then when they got it off their chest, many of them would often cry because I'd wanted to tell somebody for so long. Well, I've no doubt that pilots who have got such an increased responsibility, especially if you're a commercial pilot, flying 300 people between London and New York, and you've nearly uh, 
collided with something and you've had to take a void in action, then to not be allowed to report it because you're fearful for your career, you don't tell your wife, it never gets written down anywhere, and you know that this incident happened and it was something that was so bizarre in its movements or structure that affected you psychologically. Honestly, uh, they, it was often a cathartic experience for the police officers to unload. I was almost a counsellor because they wanted to unburden themselves. Now, a lot of pilots, like police officers, will want to come forward, and it sounds morbid, before they die. <laughs> they want to get this story out there. They want their kids to know. They want their wives to know. Uh, they want their people to know that this is real and they've not been able to tell anyone for fear of that ridicule or at the time when they were there still serving, that it was a risk to their career. Fully understandable. So that's why on anybody that comes forward to UK pilots, they will have the choice. It will not be my determination as to whether they go public. It's Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Once again, friends, welcome to another installment of Strange Planet. And if you'd like to get a little deeper into Strange Planet, you might want to consider becoming a premium subscriber. It's real easy to do. Just click on the link in the episode description, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. You gain access to commercial free listening, special bonus episodes, two per month, produced exclusively for premium subscribers, and you also receive my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. Bob Marley, One Love, opened in movie theaters in February. The biopic stars Kingsley ben Adir as Bob Marley, the legendary pioneer of reggae music, and Lashana Lynch as Rita Marley, and James Norton as record producer Chris Blackwell, the founder of Island Records. One Love not only focuses on Marley's music, but also on his social and political impact which includes the politically motivated assassination attempt on Bob and his wife by seven gunmen back in December of 1975. Of course, Bob Marley would live on for a few more years before dying of cancer in May of 1981 at the age of 36. His battle with cancer began with a, a very rare form of a fast-growing and hard-to-diagnose melanoma uh, under the nail of the big toe on his right foot. And unfortunately, had Bob agreed to an amputation when he was diagnosed in 1977, he may still be alive, but because of his Rastafarian beliefs about the sanctity of the body, he chose other treatments. Unfortunately, they did not work. However, there are those who maintain that his cancer was induced and implanted in his body by the CIA. And according to this theory, the CIA was concerned about Marley's power to the people influence and declared him a threat to U.S. interests in the Caribbean. Well, we're going to separate the wheat from the chaff uh, regarding the legend of Bob Marley. Jim Bergenstadt has been dubbed the rock and roll detective. Jim has spent a lifetime researching and writing and consulting in 
pop music history, his books on the unreleased recordings of the Beatles, Black Market Beatles, and the making of Nirvana's seminal album, Nevermind, are critically acclaimed. Jim has served as a consultant to the Beatles' uh, Apple Corps, uh, George Harrison, the Traveling Wilburys, the band Garbage, and many international labels. He's currently the co-star of two pop culture TV series on The Reels channel, Celebrity Legacies and Celebrity Damage Control. And uh, as a founder of uh, Rock and Roll Detective, Jim F- Jim's firm offers a number of specialized and confidential services to music artists and record labels. Jim, welcome back to Strange Planet. How are you? Great. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for having me on. And what a wonderful introduction. Um, so let's, um, first of all, you've seen uh, Bob Marley, One Love. Your, uh, your thoughts? Do you want to give us a, a quick review of this biopic? Yeah, I thought it was uh, it was a good a good film. I think that especially for people who are just first coming to Bob Marley, it's a good introduction not only to him but his spiritual beliefs, which are are brought to the fore. And and also, uh, I would have to say the soundtrack is is sort of a uh, a greatest hits of Bob Marley. And what's interesting is that you can also see in the film the creative evolution of some of these songs and and figure out or see where they came from. So I found it very enjoyable. I think a lot of uh, young people who who didn't grow up with Bob Marley will will enjoy it. Can you talk to me about Marley's, uh, you mentioned the sort of the evolution of the music, but Marley's uh, role in the evolution of reggae music. When did, when did it start and, and how did he take that form and build on it? You know, I'm not a, a reggae historian, so I really can't, you know, I, I can't go into any great detail. I just know that as a teenager, he started working with other people uh, to form a band and, uh, you know, they eventually made their way to a small studio, which you actually see in the film. Uh, but uh, aside from that, I can't really I can't really give you that origin. I, I focused in my book, uh, Mysteries in the Music, Case Closed, on the conspiracy theory related to the CIA and Bob Marley. All right. So let's get into, um, let's maybe create kind of a backdrop here and, and take a look at what was happening in Jamaica, kind of a violent uh, period in, uh, in the 1970s uh, when you had these... Uh, political parties and sort of their armed uh, wings or almost militias, street militias that they had um, sort of squaring off against each other. What was happening? Well, to take one half step back before we get to those uh, sort of gangs, uh, I think it's important to understand the sociopolitical activity that was happening at the time. The United States had a lot of multinational corporations at the time that were in need of a bauxite, which is an aluminum ore uh, used to create aluminum products. So you had the Alcoas and and other big corporations uh, that needed a lot of this bauxite ore. And the Caribbean happened to be the place where they could mine a lot of this ore uh, in a very inexpensive way, uh, paying pretty low wages to people on those islands. Uh, 60% of their ore was coming from the Caribbean islands, and a majority of that was coming from Jamaica. So what happened was a new prime minister, uh, Prime Minister Manley, came in, and his party was was called the PNP, and it was a, it was a party that was really moving towards socialism and away from capitalism. And so, and he had been involved in the bauxite union in Jamaica as a young man. So when he took over, he made some moves to uh, nationalize it and take it, basically take it away from the, uh, take it away from these corporations or at least make them pay a lot more. First thing they did was they had to give up 51% ownership of these mines back to Jamaica. Uh, And then later the taxes went up on them and and other such things. So that, of course, that coupled with the fact that Prime Minister Manley was visiting with Castro and having Castro advisors come over from Cuba, 
uh, we began to fear as a country that um, Jamaica was heading towards communism. And if that was the case too, we'd, uh, these corporations would ultimately lose their uh, ability to mine this uh, you know, nearby inexpensive ore. So right. they, uh, they lobbied Washington. Uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger went over there. He tried to offer uh, financial aid to Jamaica and other such uh, exchanges in consideration for um, the uh, for the Prime Minister to basically move away from democratic socialism and back towards capitalism. It didn't work. Uh, Manley sent him home. Uh, later, within a month, the United States. Uh, discontinued any approval of loans to Jamaica. And then suddenly the uh, ambassador's office, which only had an amb a U.S. ambassador in Jamaica and his secretary, suddenly had seven new hmm. uh, diplomats that joined them. And they were, it turns out, they were all CIA operatives. So their job was to basically disrupt the country and try to create so much violence and havoc in Jamaica that Manley would lose the next election to the more conservative candidate that the United States supported at the time, and his name was uh, Edward Siega. And so these, these two groups or gangs, as you mentioned, the, the JLP, which was Siega, and the PNP, all started to battle and the CIA was bringing weapons into uh, Jamaica, smuggling them in and getting them to the JLP. And so it became a very violent uh, clash between these groups over politics. And um, were they both, the JLP and Michael Manley's PNP, were they both courting uh, Bob Marley because uh, obviously he was... Uh, a very popular figure, hugely popular in, in Jamaica. Were they both courting him for his influence? Well, initially, uh, and, and really since he had grown up, Bob Marley had friends in both of those uh, political groups. And although he probably leaned a little bit towards uh, Prime Minister Manley, publicly, he always remained neutral. And in 1976, when he saw all his violence taking place, he felt, and he was aware of the, uh, he was aware that the CIA was was trying to disrupt Jamaica. Uh, he felt that the, the the best way to deal with that is to um, put on a, a peaceful concert, which was ultimately called Smile Jamaica. And the reason why I believe Marley knew about the CIA is because um, he actually recorded a song that year uh, that basically spoke to "We don't want the we don't want no CIA telling Rasta what to do" that type of thing. Right. And uh, yeah, so it was it was fun because I was able to dig up previously classified documents to discover really what was going on behind the scenes with our government and how they were trying to manipulate the next election. Let me ask you, uh, how difficult was that to do? Uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're um, doing FOIA requests, I guess, Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, were you getting cooperation or were you getting back a lot of heavily redacted documents? I got no cooperation. I wrote a letter to, first of all, I discovered that those documents had been declassified 10 years before I started to request them. So the first time I sent off a FOIA letter, it was to the Obama administration, and their letter back to me said, we can neither confirm nor deny whether we have any documents that relate to Bob Marley and the CIA, which means we have them and you can't have them. You can sue us. So I'm not going to waste time doing that. Then when uh, you know, time and money, you know, it could have been, I'd still be in litigation over it. So then... Uh, then when uh, Donald Trump came into power as president, I wrote another FOIA request. I got back the exact same letter from his administration. We can neither, neither confirm nor deny whether we have Bob Marley CIA records. So I thought that was interesting. Two different political parties in the U.S. Neither one would give me documents that are 
supposed to be available to the public. So I then happened to have an opportunity to interview Colonel Oliver North, who had been the um, national security advisor under Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, before I asked him about those records, I asked him if he'd had an opportunity uh, to talk to, to President Ford, who was president at the time all this CIA stuff was going on. And he did have that opportunity. And I said, well, why is it that I can't get these records? And he said, both, both presidents that you've written off to, both administrations should have given you those records. And, you know, we'll take a lot of time and money to sue them. But he said, have you heard of this website called WikiLeaks? <laughs> and I laughed and said, yes, I have. And he said, the records are there. You'll find them. And so that's how I was able to get records that our own government should have released to me uh, by law because they had been declassified. And, so it was a it was a fun story. And um, what did the WikiLeaks uh, documents reveal about the CIA's concern, particularly about Bob Marley? Did they have a big file on Marley? They actually did not. Uh, their main focus was on uh, Prime Minister Manley, who, of course, was a political person in power who had been elected, duly elected. And they considered him to be the big problem in Jamaica. In fact, I did not find any active surveillance or reference to Bob Marley at all in 1976 until they put in a, I think it was a, um, there was like, there's like a daily report that the president receives from the CIA every day about things going on around the world. So in December, after Bob Marley had been shot and went off to the hospital, the CIA records reflect them reading the Jamaican newspaper and basically reporting hearsay of this is what happened. There was the shooting and Bob Marley went to the hospital. It doesn't talk about any activity on their part, but that's where when I was able to get those documents earlier, it, it listed the names of these phony diplomats, but real CIA agents. And I found one who was the secretary to the ambassador. That was his fake title. And his real title was chief of station of the CIA, which meant he was the top dog handling this operation. So I located him in uh, the South, we'll say, uh, of the United States, and he's long retired. And uh, first thing I asked him was, so is it true that you were the secretary to the ambassador? And he said, yeah. Uh, and I said, is it also true that you were acting as the chief of station of the CIA? And he said, well, how can I answer that question without incriminating myself? And you I just said, did. You just did. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was interesting to talk to him about what was going on with Manley, what was going on with Bob Marley, et cetera. So. All right, we'll take a quick uh, time out. Jim Birkenstadt, the rock and roll detective, the author of Mysteries in the Music, Case Closed. There is a chapter on Bob Marley, and that's what we're discussing, of course. Also, the author of The Beatle Who Vanished, Never Mind Nirvana. And uh, we'll talk about some of uh, Jim's latest pro uh, projects as well. Take a quick time out. Back with more of our conversation right here on Strange Planet. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.
And we are back with Jim Birkenstadt. Rockandrolldetective.com is the website. The link is in the episode notes. Rockandrolldetective.com. And again, mysteries in the music. Case closed. The Beatle Who Vanished. Never mind. Nirvana. And uh, Black Market Beatles. We're talking about uh, Bob Marley and this persistent um, legend or theory, conspiracy theory, that the CIA... Uh, were responsible for the, the the cancer that ultimately led to Bob Marley's death in 1981. Uh, so let's get back to Smile Jamaica, this concert that was in the works. And mm-hmm. as I understand it, Marley was very again aware of the you know the, the the political tension, trying to walk this fine line, not to be perceived as being pro PNP or Michael Manley or. Uh, you know, aligned with uh, the JLP, the opposition. Um, but somehow, hmm. one of these two political uh, parties kind of glommed on to, to Smile Jamaica and Bob Marley um, and, and sort of took ownership of it. Can you explain how that happened? Yes. Uh, Prime Minister Manley, who was the head of the PNP party, um, had to approve this concert. And so Bob Marley went to him and, and, and explained to him that he wanted this to be a, a, a non-political, completely non-political concert, just to sort of bring people together, peace, love, you know, the whole thing. And, uh, and he got the permission from Prime Minister Manley. And then without his knowledge, when the posters came out, and in fact, the poster is illustrated in my book, Mysteries in the Music, when the poster came out, it said uh, Bob Marley in conjunction with the Prime Minister's uh, cultural blah blah department present the Smile Jamaica concert. So this really angered the JLP party headed up by uh, Edward Siega. And in fact, uh, it's funny because the PNP were running around painting, um, painting his name, but, but painting his name as CIA Ega oh. so that uh, people got the impression that he was connected to the CIA or understood that. Anyway, they were very angered by this because they felt that Bob had betrayed this alleged neutrality. But in fact, it, it was real neutrality and, and Bob was sort of taken by, you know, surprise over that. So, um, Two, two to three days before the concert, first thing that happened was uh, Prime Minister Manley announced that he was going to have an election about five days after the concert. Mm. So it was all very clear how he was lining things up. Uh, and then two days before the concert, Bob and the Bob Marley and the Whalers were rehearsing at his home in Jamaica, and uh, something like seven very young, you know, 17 year olds came in blasting guns all over the place, spraying the rehearsal room. And uh, Bob stood still, didn't even move. And he caught a bullet in the elbow. But his manager had just come in, Don Taylor, and he walked into the kitchen and he was facing Bob, but his back was to that door he just came in. And this uh, teenager, just stuck his gun around the door. It wasn't really well represented in the uh, the film, but in reality, from actual eyewitness accounts, he stuck his gun in without even looking and just pulled the trigger several times. He hit Bob in the elbow, but he, he put five bullets in the back of Don Taylor, the manager. Who miraculously lived. Yeah. Who miraculously lived. Yeah, yeah, survived. So, so that happened. And then after, and also Rita Marley was just leaving in her car. She got shot in the back of the head. Mm -hmm. She survived. And, um, they, uh, the Marley group, once they left the hospital, went up to this mountain retreat owned by, um, Chris at Island Records. Chris Blackwell. Yeah. So Chris Blackwell. Yeah. So they had to decide whether or not Bob should do the concert. And, and really it was up to Bob, but he was receiving advice from both both sides of the coin. One is you're exposing yourself to being shot again if you go up on that stage. There's no way to really protect you at a concert. 
Uh, and the other side of it was coming from uh, Jeff Walker, who was public relations man for both My Marley and Island Records. And he was saying, well, you know, you, you know, you really don't want to disappoint all these people who are planning to attend. It's thousands of people. It's still your concept of, of doing a, you know, a peaceful concert to bring people together. It's very important. He also had an ulterior motive, which was Bob had an album out called Rastamon Vibrations. And the Bob wasn't going to be touring uh, at all in the in the fall of 76 or going into early 77. So Walker needed a way to get Bob Marley and that album in front of American record buyers, which was of course their their big their big fan base there. So in those days, the only way to do that was to get you on television such as um, uh, Saturday Night Live or um, there's some midnight, Don midnight Kirk, rock show. Don Kirshner's rock concert and the midnight special. Yeah. yeah. With, right. Yeah. So you were you were trying to get clips onto those shows, yeah. midnight special, right? And so he he did want this concert to go on. And what's interesting is the cameraman hired to do the principal filming was named Carl Colby. Mm. And Carl Colby coincidentally was the son of of William Colby, who had just been fired by Gerald Ford about mm, 12 months earlier. Head of so the CIA. he really wasn't the head of CIA anymore. Right. But that's the sort of thing that starts conspiracy theories uh, when people connect dots that might not necessarily be connected. According to Jeff Walker, Bob Marley knew that Colby wa Colby's dad was CIA. Everyone in the in Marley's group knew it. Uh, Jeff Walker was with Colby the entire time. He wasn't he wasn't off shooting up Bob's house or anything like that. And in fact, if you are involved in a CIA assassination, and I lay this all out in the book, there there have been uh, former CIA agents who list what the ten principles are of a good CIA assassination, from who the target should be to after you are involved in it, you get out of that country immediately. So the idea that Carl Colby somehow had something to do with it and he hung around uh, and chatted with Bob and then filmed Bob when Bob ultimately went down to the concert, it's kind of laughable as a, as a conspiracy theory. Right. So the, were the GLP, mm -hmm. though, um, connected to the shooting? Was that ever established? Um. Based on the people I spoke to who were around Bob at that time, and uh, I'm trying to think, yeah, I, you know, I basically I came to the conclusion and I set forth in the book that the JLP gang, uh, their main their main uh, gang leader was a guy named Claude Massop, but he had been put in jail conveniently by Prime Minister Manley for ha for owning a gun. And so uh, he wasn't around. And so the second in command, whose nickname was James Brown, he, I think, wanted to, um, you know, boost his credibility and perhaps take over the gang. So he felt that the thing to do would be to send a message to Bob and go in there and shoot up the place. And, you know, given the information about how CIA targets are assassinated, given the fact that, uh, President Ford had just signed a um, a bill that prohibited the CIA from assassinating people anymore, and and he knew that he wanted to. You know, he already had trouble with his legacy because he had pardoned Richard Nixon when he became president. So I don't think that he would have wanted to go out with a legacy of having shot the most popular reggae entertainer in the world either. Right. Right. Um, and in fact, that was confirmed by Oliver North, who spoke to him about this. So it seems like it was a gang hit uh, to try to boost the credibility of um, this James Brown. So the concert that takes place a couple days later, true or false, Bob Marley still had the bullet in his elbow when he performed? True. Wow. 
he felt that if the bullet was removed, then it might have affected his guitar playing. And so he preferred to play with pain. And in fact, uh, he never had that bullet removed. Wow. And that led to some other theory about lead poisoning killing him. But in fact, um, a doctor did a full review of all of his recently did a full review of all of his medical records and said he definitely died of, of this rare skin cancer that came from the toe, not from, not from the bullet. Jim, we'll take another time out back with more of our conversation on uh, Bob Marley, the rock and roll detective stays with us. Don't go away. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Jim Birkenstadt stays with us. Black Market Beatles, the unreleased recordings of uh, the Beatles, and, uh, of course, Nevermind, Nirvana, uh, the Beatle Who Vanished, and Mysteries in the Music, Case Closed, and one of the chapters dedicated to Bob Marley, which is the topic of our conversation on this episode. Before we get back uh, to that, I mentioned uh, the Beatle Who Vanished, and we, we talked about uh, that um, the, the uh, drummer who replaced Ringo uh, for a short stint. Um, that is, well, give us an update. You're working on a, on a, a project regarding that. So um, I've recently optioned the book to a London-based independent film company called Ecos. And uh, we just signed the deal. And so the book or the movie is now in development so it will be a biopic of Jimmy Nickel, but it won't cover just his time, uh, those two weeks as a Beatle. It will also cover how did he get to be selected uh, to take over for Ringo in 1964 when Ringo was hospitalized, what it was like on tour in the middle of, in the eye of the Beatlemania hurricane. And then as a 25 year old, how do you deal with the rest of your life after you've been to the top of the entertainment world you know, how do you live your life after that? And, and what do you do? And to me, that's perhaps the most fascinating part of it is that each time he tried something, if it didn't work out, he would just leave. He would just vanish and he wouldn't tell family or friends or fellow musicians where he went and he would just go to another country and, and start all over again. And so, um, I'm on the trail of still trying to locate him. I'm hoping to locate him in time for the 60th anniversary mm -hmm. of his playing with the Beatles, which is this coming June. In the meantime, the uh, film company is in development, which is which means fundraising and hiring a screenwriter to work on the script. And I'll be um, serving as both an executive producer and a script consultant. And you're also uh, serving as an historical consultant uh, on a new rock documentary called If These Walls Could Rock. Great title. Uh, what's this all about? Yeah. Well, uh, it's based on a book of the same name, and it's about a really interesting Los Angeles hotel called the Sunset Marquee. And for many years... Uh, a lot of musicians and actors and 
and artists of all kind, authors, have stayed there. And, and many interesting things take pl- have taken place there. There are a lot of great stories that we've dug up. And then, of course, a lot of people will be interviewed who, who actually lived there. So, for example, um, Ozzy Osbourne and his family lived there when they moved from England for several years before they got a house. Bruce Springsteen lived there for whenever he was in uh, Los Angeles working on an album, bef- again, before he bought a California home. So a lot of people actually live there because there are some villas and, uh, you know, so they're fully, they're, they're fully like apartments. So um, a lot of interesting people have been able to come together. So there are stories, for example, of um, collaboration or a love story or a jam session, things like that, that we're, we're working on. Fantastic. Do we have a release date approximately? No, I think right now we're, um, Tyler Meesom, the director is interviewing various artists. Um, and I would say these are a and B level artists, pretty high up the, the food chain of, of, uh, rock and roll and pop music. And, The issue is when they're in L.A., can you catch them? If they're on tour, do they want to take the time from the tour? So there's a lot of scheduling issues with these people. So I think interviews will probably run through the end of summer, early fall. And then there's all the post-production work putting it together. So my guess is it would be on one of the streaming networks probably by um, sometime next year. All right. Fantastic. Looking forward to uh, both uh, the projects, the, um, the documentary, If These Walls Could Rock, the, uh, the 60th anniversary uh, update on the uh, Beatle Who Vanished with Jimmy Nichols, the, the June 64 tour, and um, also the, uh, the movie based on the book, The Beatle Who Vanished. All right. Let's get back to Bob Marley for a few minutes. Um, so the assassination attempt, he survives performs at Smile Jamaica with a bullet still lodged in his elbow. Um, had Marley had Marley actually come out and endorsed, I mean, what kind of impact did he have? What kind of influence? Do you think he had the power to swing an election with an endorsement, which he never gave, but did he have that kind of influence? He did have that kind of influence. In fact, the fact that he survived that shooting uh, and then had the courage to go out on stage and perform that night. And if people want, they can probably locate that a bootleg of that concert, I believe is on YouTube and it's just type in, uh, Bob Marley, smile Jamaica, and you'll find it. It's as if he became lionized as, as some sort of deity to all of the people of Jamaica at that point. And so if he had just said on stage, you know, I think you ought to vote for Prime Minister Manley or Edward Siega, that's what they would have done. But he never did take a position. And in fact, he went off to England for a couple of years. And about two years later, he came back home and he actually brought these two uh, political candidates who represented these um, gangs too. He brought them together on stage for another peaceful concert, but they all had their arms around each other. And uh, he showed that people could, you know, live in peace together. So he, he was a neutral, very neutral and, and for good reason. Um, just spend a few minutes and talk to, to, to me about Marley's lifestyle. I mean, he was not interested in, you know, fancy cars or a big house. I, I'd read a report once where he, he preferred to sleep on the floor. I don't know if that's true. Well, I think he lived quite frugally and um, he wasn't as, he, his concern was not how much money can I accumulate how many, you know, cars and whatever jets, as you see nowadays. It was, do I have enough money to feed my family and to feed all the families of my band members? You know, that that was also like a second family to him, the Whalers. And I think that that was, he wasn't concerned with, you know, gold records and that sort of thing. In fact, um, there's a great scene in the film where 
he's in London and he's finished this new album, which is probably considered his, his best album ever. It's called Exodus. Mm. And he shows the cover to the marketing person uh, at the, at the record label and the marketing person. And it just says Exodus and then Bob Marley and the Whalers. And the, the marketing guy goes, we got to have your face on the cover, Bob. And Bob's like, no, no, man, it'll sell. It'll be fine. You know? And, and he just didn't, didn't think that that was an important thing. He was, he's just such a great person. And he just cared about uh, family and his spirituality and, uh, what's funny is there's another scene after the album does really well where uh, the, the marketing guy is shown the gold record on the wall and he's like, yeah, okay, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, he was a frugal person and, and lived quite simply. Um, so the cancer that started, I guess, in the, in the big toe, was that related to maybe a soccer injury, a football injury? Um. As I understand, well, first of all, we should mention that there was a second alleged attempt on his life, a conspiracy theory, while he was waiting to decide whether to go to the concert. And wow. according to these people who weren't there at the retreat where he was hiding, claim that Carl Colby gave him a pair of soccer shoes as a gift, right. and they had a, a copper wire in them which gave him the cancer. Well, and I go through in the book all the scientific reasons why that's not possible. Also, Jeff Walker, again, was attached to Carl Colby every minute of the day. He said, not only did Carl not give him shoes or a gift, nobody got near him and gave him any sort of gift. But as to your question, it was there was a rare form of skin cancer that ran in his family background that was discovered years later. Uh, and it's possible that his soccer playing exacerbated the problem of the cancer. And again, he did ignore it for quite a while until he finally uh, was sent to a doctor. And then that was in England and he was told he had cancer. And again, he sort of sat on that information and kept going. I think two of his concerns were if I have to have my big toe taken off to save this cancer, number one, it violates sort of my religious beliefs. And number two, it will affect my dancing on stage. And number three, it'll affect my ability to play soccer. And those are all three, three things that were extremely important to him. And he did that later go to Miami where a portion of the toe was cut off, but that unfortunately was not enough to stop the cancer from spreading ultimately throughout his whole body. And perhaps he could have saved his life had he taken the whole toe, toe off. Um, did he, see, he, he was in Europe. Was he in Germany seeking treatment at some point? Oh, that's right. Yeah. I think, I think, after it got quite bad, he went to a, a specialty place in Germany that was um, trying all types of new methods to see if they could um, stop the cancer. But I think that, as I recall, what happened was once the cancer travels up to your organs and later your brain, that, you know, it's over. Right, right. Uh, and he intended to get back to Jamaica, but I guess... He, uh, they had to stop in Miami. He was too sick to, to get to, uh, yeah. to Jamaica. I think that's right. And that's where he passed away, in Miami? Passed away, yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so Bob Marley, I think he had something like 12 children. Are they all, they're all involved in the music industry, are they? Or I think they're in different ways. I mean, I think that a lot of them are helping with the family legacy business. In fact, I noticed in the credits of the movie, uh, when I watched it, the one love film was that a lot of them are named, uh, with various functions in the film. I think Ziggy Marley was an executive producer. And in fact, he, uh, introduces the movie and, um, 
at the end also i think stephen marley uh, was the music supervisor but you know there's also merchandise there's so many aspects of, of running a family legacy business and i believe that several of the family members seem to be uh regularly involved in that so uh, ultimately what is bob marley's legacy well i think you know, I think it's about spirituality. I think it's about social justice for people to be able to live a, um, a good life, to have food, to be able to work, to be able to send their kids to school. Um, you know, spirituality is very, was very important to him. And he, he spoke about these things in his music, in the lyrics. And he, he fought for what he thought was right through his music. And I think that it has, it's a music that continues to live on. And uh, just as the Beatles music keeps going on and on to future generations, I think Bob Marley's music will continue to uh, resonate to future generations for both the beauty of the music and uh, as well as the importance of his lyrics. The rock and roll detective, Jim Birkenstad. Mysteries in the music, case closed. The Beatle who vanished, Black Market Beatles, and never mind, Nirvana, all available uh, at Amazon uh, and through the website as well, are they? Um, the Beatle who vanished.com. It has uh, signed copies are available and musicmysterybook.com. They can get signed copies of Mysteries in the Music. Fantastic. The rest, but they're all available at Amazon worldwide. Fantastic. Jim, um, best wishes for future successes. Can't wait for the, uh, the new projects to uh, come to fruition. And great talking to you again, as always. Thank you very much for having me on, Richard. It was a real pleasure. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So, Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.